Ladies and gentlemen, our program will be commencing shortly. We invite you now to take your seats and switch your communication devices to the silent mode. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much and um, welcome to uh, the fifth plenary session, but also the concluding uh, plenary to uh, this uh, immensely successful 17th IISS uh, Shangri-La Dialogue. And uh, we have um, an ambitious uh, title for uh, the concluding plenary, Raising the Bar uh, for Regional Security Cooperation. And since uh, Friday at 8.15 p.m. through to today, we have in various different ways been talking about regional defense cooperation, the bilateral, the minilateral, the different multilateral uh, formations, and also the engagement of this uh, Indo-Pacific region with uh, Europe, uh, the Middle East, and uh, North America. So this uh, very large topic offers uh, an opportunity for the ministers, ministers here present uh, to essentially almost pull the threads together uh, of our debate and offer some concluding thoughts uh, to our uh, deliberations. And I'm delighted that we have three very distinguished uh, uh, ministers, and if I may also add good friends of the IISS and of the dialogue process uh, together with us uh, today. And I will ask them each to speak in the order in which they appear uh, in the program, but may maybe let me say uh, one or two words about each. First, uh, Florence Parly, the Minister of the Armed Forces uh, of uh, uh, France. Uh, we've had uh, uh, a fantastic relationship uh, uh, with France uh, over a couple of uh, uh, generations and ministers of defense and ministers of foreign affairs, uh, loyal participants in IISS uh, events and activities, and of course, uh, many French strategists engaged at the heart uh, of IISS uh, analysis and uh, activities. Gavin Williamson, the Secretary of State uh, for uh, Defense uh, of the United Kingdom, he had uh, joined us uh, last year early on in his uh, uh, commitments as Secretary of State for Defense of the IISS Manama Dialogue in the uh, Kingdom of uh, Bahrain, and we're delighted to have uh, him uh, with us here uh, on a, a quick uh, uh, Southeast Asian tour. He managed to get to Malaysia and to Brunei before coming here to Singapore and has been actively engaged in a number of uh, bilateral engagements here and I know uh, an important uh, agreement also uh, signed here with Singapore and of course uh, his engagement here allowed uh, for a ministerial breakfast to take place of the five power defense arrangements which is one of the uh, uh, minilateral uh, uh, institutions that uh, exist uh, uh, in this uh, region and that has been uh, revived Part partly as a consequence of the fact that the Shangri-La Dialogue easily permits uh, the five ministers uh, to meet here uh, in Singapore. And of course, Dr. Ung Eng Hen, uh, who is our host here in Singapore, whose Ministry of Defense has made uh, this Shangri-La Dialogue uh, possible, uh, and who will be uh, offering us uh, his uh, important perspectives after having heard uh, or been witness to some 41 different presentations somehow uh, during uh, this uh, weekend. So without further ado, could I invite uh, Madame Florence Parly uh, to take the podium and address uh, the fifth plenary session of the Shangri-La Dialogue. Florence. Ladies and gentlemen, dear Dr. Chipman, dear colleagues, fellow ministers, excellences, my dear friends. It's an honor for me to attend the famous Shangri-La Dialogue for the first time. I had been told of the privilege it was to address such an audience, but the reality exceeds the warning, of course. I would like to thank IISS, one of the very best think tanks on the marketplace, for the fantastic organization. And what I would also like to thank Singapore, our host. Singapore is a friend and a distinguished strategic partner in the region. We have a cooperation that far exceeds what most people know. Among others, in just a few weeks, Prime Minister Lee, along with Prime Minister Abe, will attend French National Day at the invitation of President Macron. And we will celebrate 20 years 
of an intense partnership between our Air Forces. It's also my particular pleasure to sit side by side with my friend Gavin on this panel. Yes, Gavin and I bicker every now and then over Brexit. The exchange goes something like this. Florence, we broke free. And I, giving you free broke. <laughs> but despite this minute difference, I cannot restate enough that Britain is our friend. Britain is our neighbor, our partner, our ally. And that when we meet here in Asia, we may no longer be part of the same European club, but still we share something of very deep significance, vision, strength, values, and a willingness to project them. This is not only a statement, it's also a reality. Those who saw our joint strikes in Syria can testify. This also will become self-evident in this region when you see our maritime task group with British helicopters and indeed British ships in it calling to port in Singapore next week and uh, sailing together certain areas. I mean those areas where at some point a stern voice intrudes into the transponder and tells us to sail away from supposedly territorial waters. But our commander then calmly replies that he will sail forth because these under an international law are indeed international waters. I'm also delighted to be here because this region for us too is home. It's good to remind that France has nine million square kilometers of exclusive economic zone in the Indo-Pacific area. 1.5 million citizens in our five overseas territories 200,000 expatriates, different sets of permanent military forces and vital economic interests in the region. Now, raising the bar for regional cooperation. There couldn't be a more fitting topic today. Actually, an observer who would have come here today and read hastily the title might have understood raising the bar for regional competition. That might have been, sadly, a better reflection of some of the dynamics at stake. Fortunately, there are also some promising elements of cooperation and I will dwell upon them. Last year, one of the issues that dominated the debates was the situation in the South China Sea. True enough, this will and should remain a key concern this year. But there's more. We are convening here in this very place, Singapore, just 10 days before a groundbreaking summit involving North Korea will take place, or won't take place, or will take place, or won't, or we are no longer sure. Anyway, surprise is part of the art of the deal, so we should let ourselves be surprised. And eventually, we all hope the summit will take place if the right conditions are met. There is a good reason for this. 
Seen from a French angle, we see three overarching security challenges in the region. First, I would mention nuclear proliferation. The development of the North Korean nuclear program has long been, see, has long been a serious threat, and it has accelerated dramatically in the last few years. Meanwhile, international pressure was really struggling to keep up. France, as a member of the P5, has always had a very strong stance on this issue, as on all proliferation cases. We've been at the forefront of UN and EU sanctions. Of course, we have observed with great interest the recent moments of enthusiasm on the inter-Korean dialogue and the gestures made by Pyongyang. But experience from the past on DPRK suggests that if you want to deal with this, with this issue, you must be ready to endure regularly a cold shower there was one at almost each important juncture. So when Pyongyang recently gave the impression that, after all, the DPRK might not be really ready to embark on what specialists call, call CVID, then someone pressed the button and here was a cold shower again. Ever since, it seems that an army of distinguished plumbers have been at work on both sides of the Pacific Ocean to restart the heater, and maybe it will be warm again. That is definitely what we hope. The second challenge I see is the respect of international maritime law. Everyone knows that some of the waterways are crucial for the economic security of, num of a number of states in the region. They are actually essential for the economic security of, the, of many states outside the region too. Their importance to individual states does not give these states a right to bypass international maritime law. France is not part of the territorial disputes in the area, nor will it be. But we insist on two principles of the rule-based international order. Disputes should be resolved by legal means and negotiation, not by fait accompli, and freedom of navigation must be upheld. The third challenge I see is terrorism. Terror has struck France and Europe repeatedly over the last few years and has not spared the Indo-Pacific. South and Southeast Asia have been badly hit too the recent attacks in Afghanistan and Indonesia are a tragic reminder that terrorism still hurts and kills everywhere over the globe. Facing the same threat, we should work together, deepen our cooperation and send a strong message. There will be no safe heaven. If we take these three challenges, and I hope you will recognize with me that they are really crucial, it would be too easy to see the limits of cooperation. Yes, there is cooperation on North Korean case, but how tight is it? Are sanctions always scrupulously enforced? It seems that North Korean tankers are regularly 
having nightly rendezvous with tankers of unknown origins, after which they come back loaded, is the least I can say. Also, in the diplomatic extravaganza we've seen lately, with delegations traveling to more places in a few weeks than they have in decades, how much is cooperation and how much is competition between contending visions and interests? The same goes with upholding international maritime law as we see profound asymmetries developing in the region, we see that non-cooperative solutions are becoming even more likely. This should be a cause to ponder and to worry. Just because the floodlights are on Panmunjom right now doesn't mean that the South China Sea issue will go away. Recent events have alerted us to that. The fight against terror is no exception. Here also, cooperation has been wanting. No one had really anticipated the incredible storming of Marawi. When addressing this phenomenon, we must also reckon with different perspectives in the region. Sure, everyone has their terrorists, but they are not always the same. That is a serious limit on cooperation. What is a Taliban? If you ask me, in most cases, it's a terrorist. But ask someone else. It might be some kind of freedom fighter or maybe even a proxy. So where is the space for cooperation then? But we can't be satisfied with that. Take a longer view and consider the future of the region. I don't like to muse with the infamous Thucydides traps, but there is a, tr a truth in this. When the balance of power changes, it's not the power we lose, but the balance. And the risks are too big for us to passively accept them. The government I represent today passionately believes in multilateralism, not in some kind of blue-eyed wishful thinking, but rather a single-minded effort backed, if necessary, by robust measures and a sense of reciprocity to address issues through patient negotiation. This was the message President Macron delivered when he spoke in the US Congress and more recently when he traveled to Australia early May. How does this apply to the region? Let me start with upholding the rule of law in maritime matters. France fully supports a code of conduct in the South China Sea, which should be legally binding, comprehensive, effective, and consistent with international law. We believe negotiations are the way to go. Meanwhile, we should be very clear that fait accompli is not a fait accepted. I mentioned British helicopters and ships joining our task group when it sails through the South China Sea. No less than five French ships sailed in this region in, this region in 2017. Europeans have started to mobilize more widely in support of this endeavor. German observers have embarked on our ships too. I believe we should broaden this effort even further. 
But the same logic applies to the fight against terror, crime, trafficking. The circumstances of France's recent history have given us the dubious benefit of having a lot of experience with fighting terror, be it on our own soil in the near east of, an, of Africa. We are eager to share our best practice with partners. We play an active role in operations against illegal trafficking, and we've made a particular effort in the establishment of a network of maritime surveillance. And we pursue a remarkable cooperation with Australia and New Zealand in the South Pacific in relation to the United States and the Quad group, and in consultation with small island states like Fiji, PNG, and Tonga in the framework of the South Pacific Defense Ministers' Meeting. Regarding North Korea, France will continue to play a major role in the United Nations Security Council and within the European Union to avoid any increase of instability and any escalation in relation with our partners in the region, especially South Korea and Japan. We welcome the signs of openness and the new priority put forward by the DPRK on economic development. Sanctions targeting North Korea's illicit activities have produced their effects. But we won't be naive. We will no, not lower the guard. Opposite, we should make sure the implementation of sanctions is absolutely robust until CVID, that barbarous acronym, can be finally achieved. But we should look beyond all these traditional man-made calamities and anticipate further risks. I'm talking of another kind of man-made calamity, climate change. Its security consequences could be huge. In the Indo-Pacific, the risks are significant that some countries could disappear in a few decades because of the sea level rising. Ever more frequent extreme weather events will create new security vulnerabilities. France is seeking to work with all the countries of the Indo-Pacific on all innovative approach to reduce the impact of climate change by anticipating the risk and setting up preventive measures. This will be a collaborative endeavor and we look forward to working with all of you on this. A final word on partnership now. To address such pressing, such serious issues, partnerships need to be rooted on solid ground. I mean friendship, values, democracy. As for France, we have started to build a very strong Indo-Pacific partnership. It's based on our fantastic relationships with Australia and India, with De New Delhi and Canberra, we have a community of vision, a security partnership, and a commitment to multilateralism. I should also mention Japan, with whom our strategic interests are aligned and we share an exceptional bond. Narrowing down the focus to Southeast Asia, France has developed a strategic partnership with our wonderful host, Singapore. 
based on trust and fueled by cooperation on defense, research, and technology, but also with Malaysia, Indonesia, Vietnam, and other countries. And of course, we embrace the important regional institutions such as ASEAN, whose centrality is a key geostrategic parameter, and bodies like the Asian Defense Minister meeting, with which France is hoping to increase its cooperation. As a maritime security provider, France is also willing to join as soon as possible the regional cooperation agreement on combating privacy in Asia. In our mind, all those partnerships have to be inclusive. So as a matter of conclusion, I'd like to recall a former prominent American politician who once said, there is no limit to what a man can achieve if he doesn't care who gets the credit. This, in a sense, is how we see the challenges in the region. Faced with so many gathering clouds, only a patient, collective, selfless effort can rein in the passions proved to see this wrong, uphold rules, disarm the climate, and show that, yes, we can raise the bar rather than the flag. Thank you very much for your attention. Florence Parly, thank you very much for laying out so clearly France's own uh, Indo-Pacific strategy, one uh, that is all the more authentic owing to the fact that, of course, France is resident in both the Indian and the Pacific Oceans. And thank you also for uh, your comment near the beginning of uh, your remarks that uh, uh, the rule of law in maritime affairs is important and we uh, should not necessarily accept that fait accompli uh, should become fait accepté, as it were, uh, which recalls uh, some of the debate we had uh, in yesterday morning sessions about exactly what one does about uh, fait accompli and is it uh, possible to reverse them uh, or to somehow attenuate their uh, strategic effects, uh, a subject that we might engage on more in uh, the discussion. The United Kingdom perspective from our Secretary of Defense, uh, Gavin Williamson. Thank is yours. Well, thank you very much, and it's a real pleasure to be here at my first Shangri-La Dialogue as well, and also to be sharing a platform with uh, two good friends and two nations who we've always worked so closely together with. Though, Florence, I was a little bit shocked. Um, it is often known that uh, Britain and France are uh, uh, greatest of friends, but also the greatest of rivals. And uh, we don't usually publicly explain as to how much we actually work together. So I felt as if we're, secrets were being revealed there. Um, but actually, as two nations, we have consistently, for many, many generations, worked incredibly closely together, and none more so than just recently, uh, supporting uh, French efforts in the Sahel, uh, working with France in the India Pacific region, and of course uh, the very closest of partners in terms of NATO, uh, but what underpins our security uh, in Europe and the North Atlantic. The threats we've been discussing are threats to our nation and to the world's prosperity and security. And it's often the case we talk about prosperity as governments. Of course, every government is very focused on its prosperity of its people. But we must never forget the simple fact that we are not able to deliver the prosperity that every nation needs without the security that underpins it. 
without the security that means that our businesses, our people, are able to have the opportunity to create the wealth, the jobs and the opportunity that we all so desire. But as we look at the threats, they come from a variety of regional dangers, whether from violent extremism that can provide a platform for global terror, whether from unpredictable state actors like North Korea and the risk of proliferation of nuclear weapons, or whether from increasingly aggressive states infringing regional access, freedoms and security through coercion and malign influence. We believe nations should follow agreed rules, but this is being ignored by some, and what this does is it undermines the peace and it undermines the prosperity of all nations, which is why we must work together to uphold the rules-based order, for it is this rules-based order that benefits us all, being resolute, pushing back against the dangers and shoring up our international system. Today, we talk about raising the bar, not simply reacting to danger, but working strategically, working smarter and working together. This region is home to some of the most technologically and advanced nations on earth, with world-class militaries and cutting-edge security capabilities. And we together must aim higher, joining forces, countries big and small, making our collective effort count for more than the sum of our parts, upping our game in maritime security, in counter-terrorism, in disaster relief, in peacekeeping, and in cyber. By working together, we will always get more for all of us. But let us be clear, the threats are multiplying. If I had stood on this stage last year and I had said that there would be a chemical weapons attack in a small, peaceful cathedral city in the middle of the English countryside, you would have said and accused me of scaremongering, talking nonsense. But the recent incident in Salisbury demonstrates the very real threats that we all face. When Russia used chemical weapons against Great Britain, the power of response was the fact that so many nations stood shoulder to shoulder with us, demonstrating our unity, our strength and belief in what had happened was unacceptable. That shows the values and strength of standing together. Multilateralism is key. It underpins the rules-based system and multilateral institutions in this region are increasingly proving their worth. We can see this in ASEAN, where the region comes together to act with common cause and unity of purpose. And the ASEAN Defence Ministers play a pivotal role in supporting a collaborative approach, along with their allies and partners, a unity of effort. And the United Kingdom stands ready to support them and our friends in any way that we can. All the while, we maintain our deep-seated commitment to old partnerships, not least of all through our involvement in the five power defence arrangements. As part of that commitment, I'm delighted to be able to send HMS Argyll to take part in exercises with our FPDA friends such as Basim Alama Lima later in this year, as we move towards its 50th anniversary, and as we collectively look to address this more diverse set of threats, we look forward to supporting the modernization of the FPDA, broadening its focus to encompass areas such as maritime security and counter-terrorism. 
and we're very keen to work together with friends and partners on a more strategic and multinational approach to the Indian and Pacific Ocean region, focusing on security, stability, and just as importantly, on environmental sustainability. We have to make it clear that nations need to play by the rules and there are consequences for not doing so. We must speak with one voice. Close coordination and communication has brought Kim Jong-un back to the negotiation table. Significantly, by working through the United Nations, we have brought to bear the combined weight of nations to the problem. That's why we deployed HMS Sutherland and HMS Albion to this region, to work with our allies to enforce UN Security Council resolutions against North Korea. And that desire for closer cooperation was the reason that we've established our British Defence staff base here in Singapore. We want to look and see how we can do more with our allies in the region, how we can support them in their aims and delivering security, not just for the Indo-Pacific region, but for the globe, to have a bigger effect and make a bigger difference. And this brings me to my final point. If we're to maintain the pressure, it's not enough to speak out. We must stand up for what we believe in, enforcing sanctions, increasing our interoperability, sharing military capability, training and exercising together. For constant vigilance is vital. If we are to root out the scourge of terror, counter malign influence, and preserve our rules-based order for the long term. That's why we've been pleased to commit three Royal Navy ships to this region this year. But having heard that uh, France committed five last year, um, I think I need to now commit six. Um, They will work and are working closely with our friends and allies across the region, demonstrating our resolve alongside our friends to protect inter international rights and freedoms. To that end, I'm delighted we're strengthening and deepening our defence collaboration and relationships across this important region. With Singapore, we're reaffirming our defence relationship as we head towards the 200th anniversary of the founding of modern Singapore. With Japan, we're sending UK service personnel for a joint land-based exercise later this year. This is the first time that the British Army has ever exercised on Japanese soil. With Indonesia, we're increasing our counter-terrorism cooperation with New Zealand. Our personnel are working together in the Middle East, Afghanistan and Africa. With Australia, we continue working closely on supporting counter-terrorism efforts across the globe. And these are just a few of the examples of a tangible cooperation between the United Kingdom and the countries that make up this region. So we are living in more uncertain and unpredictable times. But optimism has long been the hallmark of this region. And we have not yet reached the summit of our ambitions. By raising the bar of regional cooperation, by standing together, speaking with one voice and standing up for the rules-based order, we can be sure that this region will continue to go from strength to strength as we greet the dawn of an Asian century. Thank you. Gavin, thank you very much. I, I think we'll want to explore um, more um, in the debate your uh, invitation to think more about cooperation in the fields of maritime security and uh, counterterrorism. I might um, also recall that I think two, perhaps three, I think three years ago, the then French Defense Minister Jean-Yves Le Drian, now the Foreign Minister of France, uh, proposed that this Shangri-La dialogue, a more deliberate uh, European naval presence in the Asia-Pacific, 
and I'm glad to hear that if I did the math right, there will now be nine UK and French ships uh, somehow uh, deployed, at least on a rotational basis in this region. Uh, so this is an example of pragmatic European uh, cooperation that, that does not necessarily depend on formal institutional uh, arrangements. Um, we can also discuss that more. Over to our host uh, nation, uh, the Defence Minister of the Republic of Singapore, Dr. Ung. Thank you. Dr. John Chipman, my fellow ministers, uh, Minister Pali, uh, Secretary Williamson. First, let me, on behalf of the Singapore government, together with Deputy Prime Minister Teo Chihen, Senior Minister of State Heng Chi Hao and Senior Minister of State Maliki, wish you all well and hope that uh, you have found this, your time in Shangri-La Dialogue uh, productive and enjoyable. We want to thank you for your contributions to the Shangri-La Dialogue. Let me also uh, ask for our Muslim friends and colleagues uh, your understanding that we have held uh, the Shangri-La Dialogue in the midst of Ramadan. Uh, we always hold it in the first week of June, and uh, if I can ask for any excuse to do it so in the Ramadan, since uh, the French are here and the British are here, uh, let me blame the Italians. <laughs> it's a historical legacy left unsolved when Julius Caesar adopted the Julian calendar, and there's a disjunct between that calendar and the lunar calendar. Your presence, your incisive remarks and probing questions are reasons why the Shangri-La Dialogue is the premier security forum for Asia today. A record number of ministers attended this year, 40 ministers from 50 countries, a significant jump for those of you who were here in the first, the inaugural Shangri-La Dialogue in 2002 when only 12 attended. That show of support is a sure sign that the Shangri-La Dialogue does play a role in promoting regional security. It's a forum that is needed. And I'd like to thank John Chipman and his ABLE team at IISS for being steady and reliable Sherpas to guide us as we ascend the heights of defense diplomacy. Let me also record our thanks to the people who have kept us safe over this weekend. As you walk through the many security barriers, you will notice that our home team, our police and our civil defense force have been busy at work for us to be able to deliberate without fear and during this uh, Shangri-La Dialogue, as well as my SAF officers who have tended to your needs. The Shangri-La Dialogue is now in its 17th year, which is a relatively young forum but one that is very much needed in an Asia that has seen accelerated changes these past two decades. To say that the Asia-Pacific region is undergoing a tremendous change is to state the obvious. As with other regions, countries here are subject to global trends. But the impact has been amplified because the main protagonists, United States, China, India amongst them, hold inordinate influence for Asia. The rules-based order constructed post-World War II, both in trade and security, has not broken down and continues to serve as well. However, it is plainly obvious that local politics and the shift in relative strength of global or regional powers are in fact changing the rules of the international order previously entrenched. The United States is champion of the entrenched order of globalization 1.0. It's itself revisiting the status quo to address perceived inequities. Through the American first policy under the current Trump administration, the U.S.'s recent unilateral tariffs on steel and aluminum imports based on national security grounds are but one manifestation of that national stance. The U.S. military requirements for steel and aluminum may only represent 3 percent 
of the total production, but the U.S. has put forth its case for such a unilateral action. Whether or not other countries accept that it complies with WTO rules, let alone principles. Similarly, for security reasons, claimant states in the South China Sea have taken unilateral actions in disputed areas to protect their own core interests. China stakes its claims on historical grounds, and despite the rulings of the Hague Tribunal, brought about by the Philippines, has intensified its buildup of imagery, surveillance, and reconnaissance, and even counter-offensive weapon systems on disputed territories as a, as a forward position against possible encirclement. In both instances, core security considerations have been used to justify, if not make imperative, the need for such actions. Whatever the merits of arguments, these deviations from global norms challenge the status quo and accepted rules which have hitherto benefited Asia and the regions beyond. All of us would agree that it is in our collective interest to preserve a system that has lifted millions in Asia from poverty. We've we heard the phrase rules-based order used again and again on this forum. For ASEAN alone, the gross domestic product per capita has grown 30 times in the last half century. China and India particularly have grown exponentially, on average 10% and 6% respectively each year. This explains why in a reversal of roles to the United States, it was President Xi Jinping who championed globalization in his keynote address at the recent Boao Forum for Asia. I quote, we should firmly uphold the international order and system underpinned by the purposes and principles of the UN Charter. We must ensure that various security mechanisms coordinate with each other in an inclusive and complementary manner rather than undercut each other. We should stay committed to openness, connectivity, and mutual benefits, build an open global economy, and reinforce cooperation with multilateral frameworks." Unquote. All very much in keeping with all the speakers that have said so and repeated those comments on this podium. Wise words indeed, as China understands that for Asia to continue to prosper, it does need the stability that only a rules-based order can provide. But it is also clear from the actions of each that both China and the United States are attempting to address perceived inequalities and accepted principles or practices which disadvantage them. The U.S. and China, by virtue of their sheer size, both first and second militarily and economically, will be critical players in this evolution to globalization 2.0, whether by their application or articulation of new rules. Many speakers before me have sounded a cautionary note that in this process, if the global commons are not preserved, or worse, fracture into de facto or formal trading and security alliances, then all of us are in for a rough time ahead. It will be a loose-loose scenario for the world if the US and China are unwilling to work together for an inclusive system that both large and small states benefit from and where rules apply to all. We hope that enlightened minds and leadership will prevail and that US and China will avoid a trade war which can only lead to more losers than winners. Other regional powers too exert considerable influence, either individually or as a collective voice for temperance and reason. The US-China relationship is the most important bilateral relationship for the Asia-Pacific, but the state of relations among Northeast Asian states is also of critical importance for stability. The US DPRK Singapore summit is proposed to take place on June 12. Important as it is, the relationship of China, Japan, and South Korea will need to be developed beyond that of the North Korean issue to address historical animosities. I recently visited Japan and was very much encouraged by my colleague, Defense Minister Onodera's assurance 
that Japan understands the overriding calculus in shifting geopolitics. Minister Onodera said that the Japanese self-defense forces will be stepping up its engagement with the People's Liberation Army after a six-year hiatus. It is also welcome news that China and Japan will be setting up a security hotline to defuse tensions during air and maritime incidents. China, Japan and South Korea have also recently reconvened a trilateral summit at the ministerial level to strengthen dialogue and cooperation across multiple domains. All of us, I'm sure here, strongly encourage that they're taught an increasing engagement among them. I'm sure too that many of you here are delighted that India has indicated its firm commitment to the region, particularly with Prime Minister Modi's presence and eloquent speech at the Shangri-La Dialogue. India will take concrete steps to affect its Act East policy. As Prime Minister Modi announced, Singapore and India will start a new maritime exercise in the Andaman Sea involving both our countries and other interested countries. I'm also very glad that other European powers that we have heard, France, United Kingdom, well, I shouldn't call the UK a European power. I don't know what to call you now. France, Germany, United Kingdom have also indicated their physical commitment to this region. I want to thank you for both of you for uh, affirming the importance of this region and whether you're going to send 7, 9, 11, 13 or 15 ships, let me assure you that the Changi Naval Base will seek to accommodate your presence. <laughs> the renewed vigor of these countries reflect in our region reflect the recognition as well as concern about the stability of Asia because it, ha it contains key international maritime and air routes that are essential to the functioning of global commerce and markets. The Shangri-La Dialogue, summitries, bilateral engagements add to this existing multilateral platform such as the FPDA, which this year commemorates its 47th year. The security threats today are vastly different from what they were when the FPDA was conceived, but the FPDA remains a key peg for the security of Malaysia and Singapore. This web of mutually reinforcing bilateral and multilateral engagements form the foundation of a strong security architecture for the Asia-Pacific or Indo-Pacific, of which ASEAN and the 18-nation ASEAN Defence Ministers Meeting Plus remain the cornerstone. But in leading the charge, the ADMM Plus will also need to adapt to new realities and break new ground to stay relevant. Just over a week from now, the world will be hopefully watching avidly the US DPRK Singapore Summit and its outcome. But on a less dramatic, but I think no less important in its impact, the world will also watch how ASEAN and China work together to conclude the Code of Conduct on the South China Sea. Because both these events, both the process and the outcome of the COC, will shape Globalization 2.0. A substantive and effective Code of Conduct, which addresses key concerns of claimant states, as well as that of user states, will do much to boost confidence and promote stability. Another confidence-building measure is the ASEAN-China Maritime Exercise, to be held later this year. All ASEAN countries have agreed to participate and send ships or troops to this exercise. Singapore, as the ASEAN Chair, will be co-directors with China for that exercise, and we will host the tabletop exercise in Singapore in August. The ADMM Plus countries are also working closely to deal with terrorism. The Marawi incident last year and the horrendous suicide bombings by families in Indonesia recently are stark reminders that the threat of terrorist attacks to cities in ASEAN, including Western targets in them, is at the highest since the 2002 Bali bomb blast. We ignore the threat at our peril and Singapore is sparing no effort in pushing for more intelligence and military exchanges against terrorism. As part of the ADMM agenda this year, Singapore has proposed its resilience, response and recovery framework against terrorism. We are working 
hard to beef up intelligence sharing between our countries. And Singapore will host a Track 1.5 counter-terrorism symposium in October this year. With increasing contestation in the air and sea, we will need mechanisms that can mitigate or prevent mistakes. We are pleased that the ADMM Plus and Navies agreed to adopt the Code for Unplanned Encounters at Sea in November last year. We are developing a set of guidelines for air encounters between military aircraft for ASEAN, which we hope to adopt at the 12th ADMM in October this year before expanding it to the ADMM Plus. If successfully concluded, the air guidelines will be the first multilateral practical confidence measures of its kind in the world. The ADM is also building a network of ASEAN chemical, biological and radiological defense experts whose expertise can be drawn from online. There has been much talk that with the growth of China, India and ASEAN, the center of gravity has shifted eastwards. But this ASEAN or this Asian century can only be realized if all countries big and small take collective efforts to tackle our security and economic challenges together. We must succeed in this endeavor because a thriving, prosperous and stable Asia will bring to the world enormous benefits. Let me again thank all of you for your presence and contributions to this year's, this year's Shangri-La Dialogue and many more. Thank you very much. Well, um, Minister Ung, thank you very much for that. Um, not surprisingly, uh, you very ele elegantly brought together the complex threads of our discussions over the last uh, couple of days. I want to thank you very much, of course, for your warm remarks about uh, the development and growth of the Shangri-La Dialogue, and let me, for my part, say that the strategic partnership between the IISS and Singapore has been one uh, built on uh, friendship and tremendously professional uh, cooperation, and we uh, look forward to uh, a new generation of Shangri-La Dialogues to which we will shortly give uh, birth. Your Remarks, I think, on the changing distribution of power in the Indo-Pacific uh, were very important. Your reminder that challenges to the rules-based order are now coming also from quarters that usually proclaim its importance. I thought it was very significant that you reminded us all of the need for more organized U.S.-Japan uh, Korean cooperation that while the world's eyes will be on the 12th of June on the DPRK US Singapore uh, summit that success in developing a code of conduct would have uh, equal importance and your concluding remarks about ensuring that this Indo-Pacific uh, region could accommodate the aspirations of both small and big powers uh, very important and I think recalled uh, the uh, very uh, significant uh, statement that Prime Minister Modi made on the opening night here on Friday that uh, countries that stand behind rules and principles rather than just power are those who are able in time to command the most international respect. So a great deal of food for thought there. Uh, we have half a dozen people who've asked for the floor. I can accommodate a few more, and what I will do is take those uh, questions and comments and then return to the panel for uh, their reactions and uh, answers. Uh, so first uh, on my list, uh, Major General Yao from China. Uh, thank you, Jiang. Um, my question is to the French uh, Minister of Defense, and uh, first, my appreciation of your presentation. My question is kind of specific. In your presentation, you uh, voiced your support to the negotiation of COC uh, regarding South China Sea, and you also uh, made the comment that the COC negotiations and uh, the COC must be um, binding. Uh, must disregard 
fit the accompli uh, in the South China Sea. My question is that uh, France, to my knowledge, is not a negotiating state of the COC. So what kind of international law have you based your remarks on to 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 make such demanding request. Thank you. And from the UK, Richard Lloyd Parry. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Minister Parley spoke of her rejection of a Chinese fait accompli in the South China Sea. So the question for her and for Mr. Williamson is what in concrete and practical terms can you do to change the situation there? And both France and the UK have dispatched military ships in symbolic action in the South China Sea. Do you rule out actual military action as a means to reverse or halt Chinese militarization? Thank you. And uh, from Singapore, uh, Dr. Chong Ya Yin. Thank you. My question is for Minister Ng. Uh, a lot has been floated around this uh, event about values, rules, uh, but for me it's still a bit unclear. Yesterday, uh, your Chief of Navy talked about norms and the commons, but demurred on when being pressed on what to do when actors violate these norms uh, and, and these uh, understandings of rules regarding the commons. After all, you know, one of the things that allow us to understand norms is when sanctions come into play when there's violation. So I'd like to ask you, uh, what, you know, how you understand what Sing your administration, the Li Xianlong administration, would do in the event that there are violations of these norms and rules. Uh, similarly, uh, Secretary Mattis talked about uh, values and what looked like Jeffersonian values being of great appeal, uh, and that's what, what would hold the rules-based order together. I'm curious as to your views about whether these values are of any attractiveness to the uh, Li Xianlong administration. Thank you. Thank you very much. And also from uh, China, uh, Senior Colonel Zhao. Oh, thank you, John. Uh, I think uh, the, the key word in this uh, Shangri-La dialogue is Indo-Pacific, uh, which should be the big difference between this Shangri-La dialogue and the previous ones. Uh, so my, my question goes to the Singaporean uh, defense minister. So I'd like to know uh, how much uh, the emphasis of uh, Indo-Pacific uh, will, will affect the regional cooperation and uh, the existing security mechanisms in, in this region. Because we know the, the, the uh, Prime Minister Moody and uh, Secretary of Defense uh, Maris, they, they have different uh, understandings about uh, uh, or different uh, definitions about the Indo-Pacific. Thank you. Thank you. And from both Singapore and the IISS, Dr. William Chung. Yeah. Uh, thank you, John. My, my question is to the French and UK defense ministers. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Ng for counting the number of ships to be hosted at Changi Naval Base. Um, I want to ask, um, given that there's so many um, UK and French ships traversing the region, including the South China Sea, whether um, you might want to con um, conduct a kind of more, uh, what I call FON, freedom of navigation related activities that exercise high sea freedoms. Uh, this is, of course, different from the American uh, phone ops operations and whether you will conduct FON-related operations and get some Southeast uh, Asian navies, uh, Southeast Asian navies to join you as well on, on the high seas. Thank you. William, before you finish, why don't you define what you see as the distinction between those two different types of exercises? Yeah, of course, um, the, uh, of course, John. Uh, phone ops, of course, in, in the American uh, understanding is, is a legal challenge. It's not meant to be a military challenge or show of deterrence or military power. 
Whereas uh, FON related operations merely exercise, you know, you're exercising what is essentially your right to traverse the high seas, uh, uh, and this is exercisable across the world, including the South China Sea. Thank you. Fleur de Villers. Thank you, John. Uh, um, Minister Ung correctly said that the, one of the major late motif of this conference has been uh, an, a constant reassertion, sometimes a rather plaintive one, about a return to a rules-based order. Um, isn't the reality that we actually back into a previous age of great power politics where the question that is asked by this insistence on a rules-based order is whose rules? And the answer to that, as we know from previous centuries, is the rules are set by he who rules. Thank you. And from Thailand, Dr. Tamsak. Thank you, sir. Um, from the ASEAN Study Center. I should like to direct my comment and question to Minister Pali and Mr. Williamson. Your two governments still have pending reservation on the nuclear weapon-free zone in Southeast Asia. And Minister Pale, you single out nuclear program in North Korea as the first of the three security challenge in our region. Well, you are practically saying that North Korea need no nuclear weapon for deterrence, and yet your two governments also keep nuclear weapons for deterrence. So my question is, do you have any thought in your government in France and in UK to start removing your own nuclear weapons and work toward a nuclear weapon free world? Thank you. Um, Mark Fitzpatrick. Thank you, John. I have a question about North Korea, which is a subject each of the speakers mentioned. Yesterday during the Korea panel, I, I had some fun counting the number of times speakers mentioned CBID, the complete, verifiable, irreversible dismantlement of North Korea's nuclear program. And um, I congratulate Minister Parley on uh, scoring for France by mentioning it uh, herself. It's, of course, a, um, a mandated uh, requirement of Security Council resolutions. But I think we all realize that it's going to be very difficult uh, for North Korea to meet that high standard. Would, would you advise President Trump if North Korea offered something less than CVID to accept the deal? Thank you. And Peter Jennings from Australia. Thank you, John. I'd like to ask Dr. Ung, if I may, can you give us some insight into Singaporean thinking around the risks and opportunities of deciding to host the US DPRK summit and how does this impact on Singapore's role in regional security <coughs> going forward? Well, thank you very much. I think that's a pretty rich menu. So why don't we give each of the ministers uh, three minutes or so each to address uh, those questions. And I'll invite them to do so, if I may, in the order in which they originally spoke. So Florence Parley, Gavin Williamson, and Minister Ong. Florence first, please. Thank you very much. So I was questioned around the uh, suggestion I made uh, around the, uh, the code of conduct in the South China Sea. Um, I just uh, add uh, um, a proposal uh, or an opinion, which is if this code of conduct in the South China Sea is to be dealt, we strongly support this initiative. That's it. Not more, not less. Um, and I said also something that I'm sure many people in this room could share, we believe in negotiations. So uh, back to our own behavior in the South China Sea. What we're doing, uh, uh, or what we do on a regular basis with uh, allies and friends, 
is to show our attachment to the freedom of navigation. And why do we do it? We do it because um, um, under international law, you know that practice can become a right. So uh, if le fait accompli is not questioned, then then uh, a right can be, can be uh, opened. So by exercising our freedom of navigation, we also place ourselves in the position of persistent objector to the creation of any claim to de facto sovereignty on the islands. Having said that, France is not part of territorial disputes and will never be and France is not at all at war with China. So I think that by doing so, by adding and including more and more European partners to um, this uh, uh, navigation uh, in the South China Sea, we contribute uh, to the rule-based order and I do not agree with those who says that we did not act. We act by including more European uh, partners to this action. And uh, as Gavin said, um, France and the United Kingdom are extremely active and we recently met in Paris and we considered the uh, possibility of acting even more together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, very much echoing what Florence said, uh, we will continue to preserve the rights of freedom of navigation, the right of passage. This is something that has happened uh, for many, many generations. And it is by demonstrating that that we make it clear that this is something that many nations, uh, not just Britain, not just France, not just the United States or Australia, and many other regional uh, countries want to see preserved. Uh, but by the more we do it, the more clearly we send the message of many nations being able to act in that way. And ideas such as the code of conduct uh, are ones that should be welcomed. Uh, everyone wants to find a solution and the best way forward, uh, which leads you on to a very nice question of who does set the rules. Um, and uh, that is a, a complex question that uh, I was hoping Florence would answer. Um, uh, I always... Um, when you do look at the South China Sea, you see, you see a sea that has so much traffic that is so incredibly important to the economic prosperity, not just of China, not just of Korea, not just of the Philippines, Malaysia, Singapore. You see the importance of it to the whole world. Uh, if there are problems there, this is a problem for the whole world. Um, France and Britain have a very busy uh, see uh, in terms of uh, the English Channel and uh, we've always been able to work in good cooperation. Uh, I don't think you always refer it to us as the English Channel but um, 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 but, but it goes to show that actually by working together there are ability to actually find solutions to the problems and actually the set of rules that we have, the set of rules that people actually adhere to are ones that are respected overwhelmingly around the world. And it's not just by uh, Britain, it's not just by France, it's not just by the United States, it is by the overwhelming majority and people see it as the best way of preserving their prosperity, their future and their security. And rules do evolve but actually you have to be part of the system, you have to be contributing, you have to be supporting those rules uh, as in order to be able to influence them and change them. 
Um, the question was asked about a nuclear uh, uh, the nuclear challenge in North Korea, and if we propose to get rid of our nuclear weapons, I'm very pleased that Britain is investing £31 billion in our independent nuclear deterrent, uh, our next generation of uh, continuous at sea nuclear deterrent and our dreadnought submarines. So our commitment is very much there to keep a nuclear deterrent. And the final question about CVID, I feel ashamed that it wasn't mentioned in my speech. Um, um, the advice to um, President Trump as to whether to accept something less than that. I think we all recognize the challenges that are going to come ahead in the few weeks. And uh, as Churchill uh, always said, it is uh, uh, jaw, jaw. Um, and it is always best to be talking between nations. And that is what we want to and we must be encouraging. And actually it's important that there is a clear understanding that uh, what is agreed and what is uh, uh, reached for is something that is, um, understands the needs of all parties within the region, whether that is South Korea, whether that is Japan, whether that is China, or the United States, so many different nations. And that is what is absolutely key, uh, key is to making sure that the solution is one that actually is a solution for all those interested parties. Thank you, John. There were two questions that I thought were related. Um, one, what do you do, what do countries do when uh, status quo or norms are violated or status quo is tested? And, I, and related to that, I thought Fleur de Ville's uh, co comment that uh, he who rules makes the rules. Uh, f for practic pro practitioners, uh, just as Singapore is ASEAN chair this year, we take a very practical approach. Uh, we accept that uh, rules are evolving. Uh, I think uh, it was uh, uh, speakers before me who said when the balance of power changes, balance is also affected. And we're realistic, we understand this. But as practitioners, we uh, continue to focus on dialogue, confidence building measures, strategic patience that other speakers before me have mentioned. And that's why I took uh, some pains to explain what uh, Singapore's ASEAN chair will be doing for this year. Uh, are we moving back to the era where new rules are formed? I think yes and no. Uh, I'm reminded of uh, a phrase which uh, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew used, used, and I paraphrase him, uh, when he said, of all the hegemons, the U.S. is the most benign and magnanimous. Can we, by moral persuasion, dialogue, discussion, persuade hegemons and would-be hegemons to be equally benign and magnanimous? I would remind you that in terms of values, even when the U.S. chose to assert its presence here and its military power here, I think it, the acceptance was based, if I can characterize it, what JFK President John F. Kennedy said, to pay any price, to bear any burden, to meet any hardship, to support any friend, oppose any foe, in order to ensure the survival and the success of liberty. I think all the large powers and the leading powers in this region understand that. And that is why I quoted from President Xi Jinping's speech in its Boal Forum, and that underlying the contestation, underlying the shift in geopolitics, is that uh, deep understanding that stability has improved the lot of all nations here. Uh, the question was asked also, how does Indo-Pacific affect security mechanisms? I think the issue is too large to be framed by change in phrases. Asia will remain f Asia as a landmass, the security alliances will remain, the multilateral networks will remain. Uh, for various purposes, various countries have used it to re-emphasize certain aspects they thought need emphasizing. But for Singapore and for ASEAN, it is clear that 
uh, we continue to uphold the centrality of ASEAN, that we will continue to build many networks, that we will not want to choose sides, that we look for rules that will benefit both small and large states. Finally, what risks are there as uh, Singapore hosting the uh, Singapore Summit for the U.S. Uh, DPRK? In my mind, the greatest risk is to our hoteliers. <laughs> Rooms have been booked, I think. <laughs> and uh, many thousands of uh, journalists to descend on us. So if for any reason it doesn't materialize, perhaps you may want to convene Shangri-La Dialogue next week again. <laughs>
537 members of the press corps uh, attended uh, this uh, event, 150 different uh, media outlets, and for those interested in social media, over 13 million impressions uh, used the uh, Shangula Dialogue hashtag. So that, I think, is a, a pretty fantastic um, demonstration of the attention that was placed not here only in Singapore, but worldwide uh, to this dialogue that was uh, opened by uh, Prime Minister Modi, addressed uh, by uh, dozens of defense ministers and dozens more of uh, senior officials. And as uh, Minister Ong said, I think uh, that enthusiasm for meeting here in Singapore at the Shangula Dialogue over three days uh, shows, if I can use this phrase, uh, the centrality of this forum uh, in assuring that defense cooperation in the Indo-Pacific uh, takes off as well as it can. The SSS uh, uh, has uh, the unique honor of being able to partner with the government of Singapore uh, in organizing uh, this dialogue. We launched it uh, in 2002, uh, not knowing uh, whether it would uh, succeed and not dreaming uh, that it would um, get to this uh, size and importance. So we're collectively proud of the effort uh, that we have uh, engaged in. Uh, I want to thank uh, all the staff uh, in uh, the Ministry of Defense, the uh, police, uh, the armed forces, uh, the others who have kept us uh, not just secure but happy over this uh, weekend, and to announce that the next uh, Shangri-La Dialogue uh, will not take place next week. Uh, we need a bit more time to prepare than that to bring 51 uh, countries together again, but it will take place uh, 31 May to 2 June in 2019. It will not be the holy month of Ramadan then, and I hope everybody who is here will be able uh, again uh, to attend. We will make our best efforts to ensure uh, that the agenda is relevant and the opportunities uh, for genuine uh, defense uh, cooperation and dialogue are again offered uh, to you all. Uh, what I think is particularly remarkable about the Shangula Dialogue is that it is not just a place at which important statements are made, uh, conversations had, but where actual agreements uh, are signed and promulgated. So this is a place where diplomatic activity uh, actually uh, happens and is initiated and policy innovations are made. Personally, I want to thank uh, the 18 members of the I, uh, SS staff who served uh, uh, 550 delegates and several thousand others who were bad. So if you could give a warm welcome of thanks to MINDEF and the SS staff, they would appreciate it. So I think... Uh, Lunch is now ready or to be served. May I, may, may I wish you all a very safe trip home. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.